Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm sure the reason that there aren't more people here is that uh, people are too busy. Um, I'm going to talk about the problem of being busy. This is a, a talk about, about time and how we ought to be thinking about time. Many of us, I mean, perhaps this isn't so here in Totnes, but many of us feel that we have lives that are too busy, that we're rushing around, that we never have any time to ourselves, we, that time is short, and we know the saying that time is money. Um, money makes the world go round, so we've got to keep on using more and more of our times, being busier and busier, and that'll be good for us. Well, the um, message I have here is that uh, that might not necessarily be the case. In fact, it's really quite recently that we have come to think about time in discrete uniform units that can be that are the same anywhere in the world. So a second in Totnes is the same as a second in Shanghai, and a minute in uh, London is the same as a minute in Los Angeles. And of course, these uniform uh, units are, uh, become, have become a tradable commodity. Now, this is a recent development since the Industrial Revolution, in fact. This is a picture of a lovely old sundial that's in the uh, Archaeological Museum in Istanbul, and it shows that we've always been interested in kind of telling the time by the sun, but not um, always have, we haven't always experienced time as uh, these equal units. Time is not equal everywhere. We experience it in many different ways. We can experience it as a, as a gift or a, a tyrant. Um, we can sometimes time will stretch out over what seems like a very long period of time, but it's actually just for somebody else it'll be perhaps five minutes. Um, so we can we can give time. We can find that time oppresses us. We can use time in different ways. We can experience time with the seasons, with the turning of the year, with. Um, th differently throughout our life cycle. If you think about the way in which life, as you get older, life seems to go by faster than it does when you're a child, that's another way in which time can be experienced in very different ways. So that's the first thing to think about. Time is not just uniform seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, etc. Time is what we make of it. So in this book, now you don't have to buy it, but I did bring a lot of it down from uh, London on the train, and it would be nice not to take it back with me, that this book of ours, uh, which is for sale today, um, makes this proposition. What would happen if we move gradually, over, say, a decade or more, towards a shorter average paid working week, so that it became, instead of five days, it became four days, or 30 hours, or the equivalent of 30 hours stretched across a year, so it might be divided up in different ways. But that the idea of a four-day week or its equivalent became the new standard. So that's our proposition. And we make it because we think it's very important to change the way that paid and unpaid time is distributed across the population, and also to get people to understand that we don't have to think about and experience and use time in the way that we usually do. Now, there's no such thing as a new idea. Here we have John Maynard Keynes, the great economist, who um, predicted in uh, 1930 that by the 21st century, we would only have to work 15 hours a week because um, the uh, productivity would increase to such an extent and we would get, the workers would get the productivity gains and they wouldn't have to work so many hours to get so much money because of the productivity gains. That was his basic premise. Um, and he thought our only worry would be, how are we going to use all this freedom? And of course, he was spectacularly wrong. He was right about lots of things, but he was spectacularly wrong about that. So we live in the fast lane. Maybe not here. I've come down from London. We do live in the fast lane. It's very stressful. We're all very busy. Um, it's very hard to keep control of your time. But why is it that some people spend so much time in the fast lane doing so much paid work, working 40, 50, even 60 hours a week? 
while others have little or none. So what is it that makes us work long hours? First of all, many people just want the money. Some people really need the money and have to work hugely long hours just to feed their families. Um, some people just want more money. Some people work long hours because they want to buy more stuff and they feel they need to buy more stuff. Some people work long hours because they have friends at work and work is much, paid work is much more congenial than it used to be for many people. It's a place where you make friends, where you, you accumulate status and um, we've also been led to think by our politicians that the most valuable sort of person is a hard-working person. Do you know that phrase, that hard-working families? It's, we will only support hard-working families. Anybody who isn't a hard-working person or a hard-working family is worthless. So if you're not working hard and long hours for money, you have no value. That's the story that we are told by our politicians on both sides of the political spectrum. So there are values that are attached to the idea of working hard and, and long hours. Uh, by the way, I've got nothing against hard work. I work hard myself, but it's about this balance. One of the reasons why we're interested in shorter working hours is because we face this crisis. We have a, a triple crisis. There's accelerating climate change, widening social and economic inequalities, and of course the economic downturn, which doesn't really show much sign of really making a so-called recovery since the financial crash of 2008. And this is a toxic combination of crises, and it is unique in human history. We have never had this combination of crises before. So we think that thinking differently about time can help us to get out of the mess that we're in. We're not suggesting it's any kind of a silver bullet. It certainly isn't. But we do think that it has some promise. There aren't very many levers you can pull these days. There aren't very many variables you can shift around. But we think that time is something that hasn't been sufficiently considered and needs to be thought about more carefully. So I want to go through some of the reasons why we think it's a good idea to move towards a shorter working week. We have the social reasons. For example, we know there's plenty of evidence that if people work long hours, they get anxious and stressed, and that tends to have a poor effect on their health. So working long hours can be quite bad for your health. That's one reason. Another reason is that you have an enormous disparity of control over time between different kinds of people, and particularly between women and men. And the gender imbalance in the distribution of paid and unpaid time between women and men is something that locks us into gender inequalities that we've been fighting against for many decades now, but still find it difficult to, to achieve any kind of real equality between women and men. And if we were to distribute paid and unpaid time more equally between women and men, we think that would make a huge difference. So there's the gender reason. Then there's the fact that it will free up time so that people can be better parents, better carers, better friends, can spend time doing more creative things, can be better citizens. I think one of the reasons why our democracy is kind of in such a moribund state is that people don't have time to find out what's going on in the world, to be active in their communities, to, um, to be politically aware and to be politically active. So we need more time under our control for an effective democracy. And then there's the point about uh, older people. A as things stand now, you can be, um, say, 65, you've been working 40 hours, you suddenly retire, and you're so-called doing nothing. And it can be really bad for your health and very bad for your mental health and your physical health. And um, lots of people die, actually, at that stage of their lives because they cannot cope with this sudden change. But you could have a much, much more sensible and gradual transition from uh, working to working less to not working at all for, for money, but possibly doing other things. Spread out over, let's say, um, two decades, why not? 
Um, so that's uh, another reason why we think it would help this question of retirement. Lots of people have real problems making that transition, and we think it would, this would make it much easier. So those are some of the social reasons, added to which the, if people are, um, if you can spread out the paid work more evenly across the population, you'll have fewer people who are unemployed and claiming benefits, and that would be feeling bad about themselves because they're unemployed, so more people would have jobs. Then there are the environmental reasons. There are two things that go on here. One is that if we move towards a shorter working week, we will start to, people will be earning, some people will be earning less. Perhaps most people will be earning less. And that will we'll start to challenge the idea that the only thing we live for is to work more, to earn more, to buy more stuff. So it's a way of undermining that conventional wisdom, if you like. So we will be buying less stuff, and a lot of the energy-intensive goods that we buy and things that we do are to do with our busy lives. So we'll take an aeroplane instead of going by train, or we'll take the car instead of going by bike or by bus or on foot. We'll buy um, processed foods, ready meals, instead of perhaps growing our own vegetables and cooking our own food. We will chuck things away and buy new stuff when things break instead of getting things repaired. So living life in the slow lane rather than the fast lane is about living life more sustainably, providing the, creating the conditions for people to live more sustainable lives. You may not know this, but if you look around the outskirts of any big city in this country, I don't know about around here, but certainly in London, you see these uh, personal self-storage units. This is the fastest growing sector, business sector in the UK, personal self-storage. So it means that we're filling up our houses, our outhouses, our attics, our garages, whatever, and then we've got so much stuff, we get a personal self-storage unit. We've got more stuff than we can possibly use in our lives. It's also, so it's good, we think it's good for society, it's good for the economy, for the environment, and it's also good for the economy. There is evidence that shows that people who work shorter hours are more productive hour for hour. If you have a workforce that is, um, has a better balance between paid and unpaid time, they tend to be more loyal, more committed, um, healthier, uh, more rounded, and all those things are good for the business bottom line. And indeed, there have been many instances when employers have switched to shorter hours, sometimes in a crisis, to avoid making workers redundant. There are all sorts of ways, experience that employers have with shorter hours, but it tends not to be uh, regarded as something that is normal to do. But it, is, it could be good for the economy, and certainly the uh, economists who are looking at how you can manage a sustainable economy that isn't growing exponentially, uh, because we cannot have a an economy that grows exponentially. They will uh, look at working time as one way of solving the problem of an economy that doesn't grow, which tends to create more unemployment. And instead of creating more unemployment, you take the work that is available and you distribute it more equally across the population. So it's a better way of managing a sustainable economy. That is an economy that isn't growing. So just in case you think this is all pie in the sky, we've actually just finished a, an exercise looking at all the examples around the world, and as many as we can find, of how things being done differently. Uh, we have uh, an example of the Utah, state of Utah in the United States that put all the public sector workers on a four-day week. This was for a, 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 a two-year experiment, actually, it lasted. It was very popular. They didn't reduce their hours, they did four 10-hour days, but um, that meant they had a three-day weekend, and it was very popular. It saved the state money, and it reduced the carbon footprint of the state. This has all been evaluated by academics at Stanford University. Um, the reason it came to an end was about, it was about political infighting in the state, in the council, but not, in, um, not because it didn't work. Then in Gothenburg, just this year, the, I don't know if you heard about this, but the, they announced that they were going to put one department onto a 30-hour week without a drop in pay, 
and compare their performance over a year with other departments to see whether it made a difference or not. Because they believed that after 30 hours, people stopped being so productive. They don't work so well. So that's the Gothenburg in Sweden experiment. In Gambia last year, the government announced that it was going to move to um, a four-day week so that people would have time off for prayer and farming. And Google, you, some of you may know, give their employees 20% of their time for themselves for innovation. So they have got the message about you needing to have time to yourself in order to be creative. So these are just some examples. We've got about 100 on our database now of uh, organizations and countries where people are working shorter hours. And when we first brought out our first publication about this, which is called 21 Hours, uh, we, got, we were completely inundated with people writing to us saying what they were doing. And here are just two examples. There's one person who said uh, he used to work from 7.30 to 7 o'clock and he loved his job, but he hated the hours. And then he, he changed his life and he's greatly enjoying the, uh, the way he lives his life now without these long hours, but he needs to get a job again. But he wants to keep hold of it. So he's had an experience of working shorter hours and wants to hold on to that. And the other, the head of a specialist law firm on the south coast of England, said that nearly all his staff work part-time in various ways, and they could still be competitive with leading law firms in London. And he was sure that the fact that his staff were living balanced lives and were happy in their work because of it, that's what made them successful. So there are just two more examples. It can happen, it does happen, and it can work. Now I want to show you these figures. It's interesting to see that between 1980 and 2010, look at the average hours per capita between four countries, the USA, the UK, France, and Germany. And you'll see, look at France and Germany, and you'll see how they were almost exactly at the same point in 1980. And look how they diverged over that period, three decades. The message there is that it doesn't have to. It, things can happen in widely different ways. In other words, that the path that the United States took was very different from the path that Germany took. And um, there's no sign that, they, that one has a better econ uh, stronger economy than the other. And if you look here, there are 10 countries. You look at the, these are the average working hours per capita in 10 countries, Netherlands at the top, Italy at the bottom. Now, if there were a match between the average hours per capita and the strength of a country's economy, you would um, expect the next graph to follow that red line. But look. So there's no correlation between the strength of a country's economy, as measured by GDP, although there are other and better ways of measuring it, an economy, but that's another story, uh, and the average length of the working week. So how are we going to get from here to there? Well, there are a number of different proposals for making the transition. One is, and this really is for workers who are on average pay or above, is if, the, if you're in an organization where you have an annual pay increment, um, you trade some of the pay for uh, time each year so that you gradually reduce the amount of hours that people work. Now, that won't work for very low-paid workers because you've got to do something else there. But it, what it will do is it will challenge the idea that, or change the idea that success and long hours go together. Because at the moment, we think that people who are rich and successful at work uh, work very long hours, and that's what everybody has to aspire to. And you want to try and change that pattern of aspiration. So that's one proposal. Another proposal is that um, every new labor market entrant, young people coming into the labor market for the first time, starts on a 30-hour week and then remains that way. So that each year you get a new cohort until there's a critical mass of people on the 30-hour week. And then at the other end of the age scale, you could take, say, people who are on who is age 55, and they could reduce their working week by one hour a year. 
So if you're on a 40-hour week at 55, by 65 you'll be on a 30-hour week, by 75 you'd be on a 20-hour week, and you'd barely notice the difference. So as time went by, I mean year, year on year. Those are just some suggestions for how you could begin to make that transition. And this is a very important point. You have to tackle low pay at the same time. Some people say we have to work long hours because we couldn't afford to um, eat or clothe ourselves if we didn't. The answer to that is it's not about working longer hours. It should be about the level of pay. So no one should have to work long and social hours in order to get by. It's just, it's, and we need to tackle low pay because of this, going back to the point that Keynes made, it hasn't, things haven't worked out as he anticipated, which was that workers would get an increasingly, they would get more money for less time as time went by because productivity would increase. That hasn't happened, but we should be able to challenge the levels of pay that people are paid now. So we're talking about a higher minimum wage we're talking about a living wage, and we're talking about thinking in terms of what, what do we need as a living wage to, to work a, if we're working a 30-hour week. So we've got to increase our expectations of what a living wage would be. And we've got to increase that we have a series of proposals on low pay at the New Economics Foundation, which include things like stronger workplace bargaining power, which we need to reclaim it having been swept away since the Thatcher years, and um, making firms publish the pay ratio between the lowest and the highest paid, and various other things of that kind. But it's important to see a campaign against low pay at the se as a sort of parallel activity to a campaign for a shorter working week. They go hand in hand. Well, yeah, such a good idea. Who could possibly be against it? This isn't anybody in particular, but it represents a kind of conventional employer who would think that he couldn't manage or his people couldn't manage uh, a workforce where everybody's on short time. It would be too complicated. That's clearly not the case since there are many employers who do that without their business suffering. Um, there are plenty of, I think the trade unions are a bit worried about this proposition because they think that it, that it undermines their campaign to increase pay um, but one of the reasons why we suggest this should be a gradual move over a period of, say, 10 years or more, is that we think that we need to change people's uh, mindsets and their expectations and their aspirations gradually. We're not suggesting that we come in with legislation and uh, force everyone to do it. We don't want sort of, the time police going around the... Um, the cafes and the bars and saying, why aren't you at work? But or, why, why are you there? So it's a gradual process. We need to show that it can be done. It can be done. Um, and I like to end with this. We might think that it's inconceivable that you could move to a shorter working week, but we have to remember that there are many things that have changed that were once completely inconceivable. And then over a relatively short period of time, it became inconceivable, it, it, things changed and it was inconceivable to move back again. And the examples I've got here are the slave trade, um, compulsory wearing of helmets for people who, rode, who ride motorbikes. There was a terrible campaign against that when government proposed to make people wear crash helmets on motorbikes, it said it was a dreadful incursion into individual liberty, but now we wouldn't say that people should should be allowed to ride around on motorbikes without a, without a helmet, I don't think. The smoking ban in public places, that would have been inconceivable about 20 years ago, perhaps 15 years ago, and now, would we go back to allowing people to smoke in restaurants and bars? I doubt it. And the last but not least, all the advances that women have made over the years, that again, were once considered to be unimaginable, well, were un unimaginable, and now, we we couldn't imagine going back. So it is possible to change. You, you need the right conditions. You need evidence. You need leadership. You need a strong campaign. And you sometimes, often, you need some kind of a crisis to tip things in the right direction. But uh, all these things have changed. And I think we can change on a shorter working week as well. So 
that's the end of what I'm going to say. We can discuss it. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>